So what does the research actually say about the effectiveness of a single set of exercise to momentary muscle failure in multiple sets of the same exercise to muscle failure? So the thing is, I've been thinking about this for the past couple of days. I, I would like somebody to come up with a physiology-based reason for doing more than one set. Like, physiologically, what's the reason? I don't want to hear a reason that these bodybuilders do that or I did that and that's what gave me results. I want a physiological reason because I can, I can give a very specific reason based on physiology and neurology why a single set is all that is necessary if, of course, you're training all the way to failure. But I just can't seem to find a physiological reason or a neurological reason why doing more than one set is required. I, I just, I mean, what's the reason? Um, you know, so if we look at the recent, you know, the, if we look at the body of literature, and there was a, a really good study put together by a bunch of exercise scientists. Um, let me see. I think I have it here somewhere. And basically what, what they concluded was they, they looked at all the mechanisms. They, they really wanted to find what are the primary drivers of the primary mechanisms of muscle growth. You know, previously it was believed that um, muscle damage or microtrauma it was previously believed that in a lot of a lot of misinformed kind of you know idiots will say well you tear your muscle down and then they build up back stronger absolutely not <laughs> that's not how this happens but this did lead to a, a previous belief that you know muscle damage contributed to muscle growth but based on all the literature doesn't appear that that's true and there was belief that metabolic stress contributed to muscle growth after reviewing all the literature these exercise scientists found that that's not true either um let me see so what they really found was that the only thing that really points to the main driver of muscle growth is the mechanical tension or mechanotransduction or just hard contractions. So if metabolic stress in muscle damage were contributors to muscle growth, which we used, I mean, some people used to think they were, then there might be an argument for doing more sets, more repetitions, more volume. Because if you're doing more sets, more repetitions, more volume, you're accumulating more muscle damage. You're accumulating more metabolic stress, metabolite production. So then it would make sense. But considering that we've recently found that those aren't drivers of muscle growth, now it really doesn't make sense. This is the study I'm referring to. So an evidence-based narrative view of mechanisms of resistance exercise induced human skeletal muscle hypertrophy. So they included like 140 studies. They just, you know, there's some confusion. Like what are what's actually making the muscle grow? This is still in its infancy. You know, we're we're still we we know a little bit, but in 50 years, we're going to know quite a bit more, I'm sure. You know, we're looking. We don't, we don't have a perfect, solid, conclusive idea of how muscle actually grows. But we do know that if you load it hard, progressively, over time, 
it will grow. So, you know, when you look at the study here, and I think you got, if you guys are interested in this, if you're like a trainer or something, you guys got to read this. I've read this thing like fucking 20 times. Um, this seems to be the primary driver, mechanotransduction. I've said this on many live streams before. Getting the mechanoreceptors and the mechanosensors to turn on by contracting the muscle heart. And that's, that appears to stimulate a bunch of metabolic processes, most specifically the mTOR C1 pathway to tell your muscle to grow. So there was prior belief that things like acute changes in anabolic hormones stimulated muscle growth. Such as, you know, a lot of people say, well, the squat and the deadlift increases growth hormone and testosterone, and that's what causes you to grow, and that's why they make you grow. No, that is extremely false. So after reviewing the literature, what they found was there really isn't a large change in anabolic hormones like growth hormone and testosterone from exercise. It's a very small change, and it does not contribute to your muscle growth. Um, this change, this acute change in anabolic hormones. So it's not that. Resistance exercise induced muscle damage. Now, if you read through this paragraph here, well, what they found that muscle damage doesn't seem to contribute to muscle growth either. Because the muscle um, in some in studies grew with very little muscle damage. So that's not it. Metabolites or metabolic stress. I used to believe this too, but then when I read newer literature, I changed my mind based on the information we have. Metabolites, metabolic stress, um, lactate, things like this, stimulating the mTOR pathway. There was a belief that it did that. Um, doesn't. So... If all the things that we used to think stimulate your muscle to grow, that more volume would accommodate, if these things now we know don't contribute to muscle growth, then there's literally no argument at all for doing multiple sets. So the goal is, it appears that this mechanotransduction is, is a, the primary stimulus for the mTOR pathway. <clears throat> so we need the mechanosensors or mechanoreceptors to sense tension. How do we do that? We contract your muscle. How do we get these mechanosensors or mechanoreceptors to sense tension in a lot of muscle? So that way, a lot of muscle is stimulated for growth with high effort. And the size principle clearly states more muscle fiber is recruited by your nervous system the harder you contract and the harder you push your body. So if mechanotransduction or mechanical tension, as clueless bodybuilders like to call it, is the main driver of muscle growth, how do we get the most mechanical tension with the highest amount of intensity of effort? But the thing is, once you turn on these mechano transducers, mechano sensors, mechano receptors, whatever you want to call them, you can't turn them on again. So it's very, it's, it's a lot like if I took this button and I clicked on. Okay, ready? I'm going to turn off this light, right? All right, so I've done a set to failure. I turned on my mechano sensor. It's biological, this biochemical process. I'll show you. So... This right here, mechanical stress, 
mechano sensor in the, co the costumere turns on a biochemical pathway that stimulates the mTOR pathway. So I've turned that on with my one hard set. Now I'm going to do another hard set and another hard set and another hard set. So notice once I turn this light on, I can't turn it on more. It's already on. Doing additional sets after you turned on this, let me find the other. So this here, after you've activated the mechanoreceptors, see how it says Constamere, FAK, this is the biochemical process which downstream turns on mTOR. Once I've activated these, I can't activate them again. Additional sets would be like trying to turn this light on more after I've already turned it on. While accumulating muscle damage, and what the research did find is that more muscle damage doesn't contribute to more muscle growth, just a longer recovery time. So notice this paper here, or this chart here, showing the process of this mechanotransduction. It says RET, resistance exercise training. Notice what it says underneath it. Higher intensity of effort. So what does the research really say about training? High intensity of effort training stimulates mechanotransduction, stimulates muscle growth. And what would be the physiological reason to do this more than one time? So if muscle fiber is recruited based on effort, not based on volume, well, then it would make the most sense to just do one really hard set all the way to failure. So your nervous system recruits the most amount of muscle possible. You know, you could take three sets to gradually weaken yourself to a point where the last set requires a lot of effort because you finally made yourself so weak that you have to put a lot of effort in to get those 10 reps. That's just inefficient. Now, I could do 10 reps, wait a little bit, get some fatigue, weaken my muscles, do another 10 reps, weaken, fatigue. And then by the last set, the first 20 reps weakened and fatigued me enough to where I really struggle to get the 10 repetitions on the third set. And that struggle is what causes your nervous system to recruit your muscle. But as you can see, that's a really ridiculously inefficient way of doing it. Why not condense it into one set? What's the purpose of a set? Do you think your body knows what the fuck a set is? No, the point is, okay, we need to stimulate mechanotransduction. We stimulate more mechanotransduction in more muscle fibers with a high intensity of effort. This is a neurological fact, irrefutable, undisputable. And anyone who disputes it and refutes it is simply a moron. That's it. You can't change reality. And the reality is... You recruit and stimulate more muscle fiber. You stimulate more. You activate canotransduction in more muscle fibers. The harder you push your body because your nervous system recruits more muscle fibers the harder you push your body. And nothing to do with volume. So what's the argument for multiple sets? So if this is an actual physiological reason based on the current information we have by exercise scientists, what is the physiological reason for multiple sets? What is the physiological reason other than simply taking more time? So if the damage doesn't stimulate muscle growth and the, pet and the metabolites don't stimulate muscle growth, clearly the amount of times the weight goes up and down has nothing to do with muscle growth, then what's the argument for multiple sets? I, I haven't heard a good one other than Phil Heath does it, or that's what I did, and I got strong. Those are called anecdotes. It's not a logical explanation for it. I'm just waiting for a logical explanation. 
you know, I don't want to see Krieger's meta-analysis that has so many flaws in it. It's unbelievable. Krieger did a meta-analysis on the efficacy of multiple sets, and he literally misrepresented most of the studies. He said things the studies showed that the studies didn't even show. Okay. Don't show me a meta-analysis. I want a physiological fucking explanation. Because I can give you anecdotes. I can give you myself as an anecdote. I've got a gazillion testimonials. I've got hundreds of recorded charts from my training studios showing tremendous progress training with single sets to failure. So those aren't even anecdotes. That's literal data. So where's the where is the argument for multiple sets? It just doesn't make any sense. Now, <laughs> Drew Bay shared something, and we're going to go over something he posted in his hit list group. Um, but he posted this funny meme. Let me see if I could show you. <laughs> So he posted this being an old timey doctor would rule just as drunk as hell. Like, yeah, you got ghosts in your blood. You should do cocaine about it. And he made the comparison. He said, this is how they're going to look at many of today's exercise scientists in a hundred years. Being an old timey exercise scientist would rule just caffeinated as hell on social media. Like, yeah, you got poor explosiveness, core strength and glute activation. You should periodize your training and do multiple sets of Bulgarian split squats, plyometric stability, ball hip thrusts about it. <laughs> it's true. Like, imagine how fucking stupid these exercise scientists are going to look. Because most of what they're recommending is based off of opinion. So he wrote a cool paper, uh, an article called What Research Really Says About Single Versus Multiple Sets. So this was back in, so this was uh, from Iron Man magazine in the 1990s um, from Arthur Jones. So Arthur Jones wrote an article talking about what the research actually says about single versus multiple sets. And this was back in 1996. Okay. They were, they were arguing about this shit for 30 years. So he looked at the studies at the time that compared the two. So the first study was by Richard Berger. We've talked about this before. Using 177 subjects, a period of 12 weeks. Using the bench press as an exercise being tested, which is a poor measure of muscular strength because it's a combination of strength and skill. So the more you practice, the better you're going to get. If somebody practiced swinging a golf club five times per week versus another who practiced 100 times per week, well, this person who practiced 100 times per week is going to be better. And their ball is going to go further, not because of their strength, but because of their skill. Okay. So one set increased average strength group, 23.6%. Two sets increased the strength 24%. Only four tenths better for another set, taking twice as long. Three sets increased 26.3%, only 2.7% better than one set. So this is well within what's considered the margin of error in measurement. Okay, It is not a significant difference. You would not notice for three times the amount of time spent in the gym. If this were even true, but if you're using the bench press as a measure of strength, the obvious reason is the multiple set group had more practice and a better neurological adaptation. Duh. So it's it's not actual muscular strength. But if it even if it were true, would you really, an average Joe, okay, if you're a bodybuilder, professional athlete, whatever, this doesn't apply to you, but if you... An average Joe 
would you spend three time three times as much time in the gym for a 2.7% increase? Or would you spend one third of that time for 2.7% less? So we have to kind of look at it that way. All right. It doesn't make any sense. And the best, if this were true, which it's not because of the flaws in Berger's um, study, which we'll see in a second. But that would be the equivalent of working 20 hours a week in overtime for 50 cents an hour. Now, would any of you work three times your hour? Three times. So if, if you work 40 hours a week, would you work 120 hours a week for an additional $50? Of course. Of course you wouldn't. <laughs> it's insane. It's a waste of your time. Just like if this were true, which the faults in the studies show it's not, you would be spending three times as much time in the gym for a 2.7% difference. So be careful when people present multiple set studies that support multiple sets. It'll say, oh, 1.2% difference or a 2.7% difference. And guess what they'll say? Multiple sets are better than single sets. Okay, but how much? 2.7%? Three times longer in the gym? For 2%? Now, if you value your time, which you should, that's insane. So... Here's some, when you look into Berger's, um, so this is Arthur Jones writing about Berger's study. Secondly, considering the fact that Berger was using healthy but previously untrained college age, age men as subjects, his overall results were somewhere between pitiful and god-awful. The starting strength of his subjects was very low, which means that they had the potential for rapid and large-scale increases in strength, yet failed to produce any such results. In contrast, 13 years later, in 1975, using military cadets as the subjects during a study at the U.S. Military Academy in West Point, we produced an average strength increase of 60% in only a period of six weeks. While Berger, the best he did was 26.3% in a period of 12 weeks. That's how bad that fucking study was. <laughs> So our results were more than twice as good as Berger's, even though we trained our people half as long as he did. So think about it this way. Berger was doing one, two, and three sets for a period of 12 weeks. The best he did for an improvement in strength was 26.3%. Arthur Jones got an average strength increase of 60% with one set in six weeks. Why? Because he was actually focusing on what makes your body change, which is intensity of effort. Okay. So Arthur Jones, he lists um, seven additional studies comparing single to multiple sets. And what do you find? Sylvester, 48 subjects. Once it increased 24.6. Three sets increased 26.2. Difference in only one. 0.6%, non-specific, no significant difference. 28 subjects, seven weeks, one set compared to three sets, no significant difference. Okay. So people will say no significant difference does not mean equivalence. Well, no. But if you're spending three times longer in the gym, for an improvement that you will never be able to notice in the amount of repetitions you can do with a particular weight, in the amount of weight you can do, it will be virtually meaningless. And a difference in, let's see if they, there's somewhere they compared muscle size. Now, most of these are comparing muscle strength. When you get to the ones that compare muscle size, they're literally equal. 
let's see. Here's another study. Wayne Westcott, no difference result from one, two, or three. No meaningful difference. This one, Jay Gray's did got better results from one than two. And this is one I've I've cited before where they found one set to be more effective than two and three, or than three. So if you look at the actual research of single versus multiple sets, and you don't look at meta-analysis by Schoenfeld or Krieger, if you look at the actual studies that were performed, there's no meaningful difference. Now, if you're going to spend three times as much time in the gym, wouldn't you want a significant difference <laughs> like if you're gonna spend if you're gonna work 80 more hours a week aren't you gonna want like a significant amount more money so you got to think of it this way where's the argument for multiple sets because i'm not seeing them i'm not seeing a good argument that's just that That's my case. That's my case. Sooner or later in your life, you're going to be busy. You're going to have, hopefully, a family and kids, a career, a house to take care of. There's going to be a period of your time or a period in your life where time is going to be short. If you're not a hobbyist bodybuilder, you're going to have to find an efficient way to work out or you're fucked. Everybody should find an efficient way to work out like my golden era system. If you haven't tried it, imagine you can get at worst the exact same results in most cases, better results training just two times a week and your workouts lasting 30 to 45 minutes. Imagine that because it's true. And at some point in time, people are going to need to do this because there's going to be a period in time when you're very busy. You have important things to do instead of go to the, go to fucking uh, crunch and stare at yourself in the mirror for an hour and a half. You're going to, you're going to have, hopefully you have decent priorities in life. You're going to have, things to do, people to take care of, families to support, businesses to run. You're not going to have an hour and a half a day to go stare at yourself in the mirror and do 17,000 sets. You're going to have to find an efficient way to train in order to continue to maintain your health. You need high-intensity training. You need the golden era system. So what I found is a lot of a lot of people will stop exercising altogether, become an unhealthy mess of a person because they don't have nine hours a week to spend in the gym. Well, guess what? You don't need nine hours a week. Anyone that tells you you do is lying. And that's just that. Now, if you're a hobbyist and you love exercising, you're a bodybuilder and you love it, you love being there, you love pumping iron, well, fuck. In that case, do multiple sets. This is not for you. What this is for is the people who have seen shit results because they're under the impression they need to spend five or six days a week in the gym just repping shit out without any sort of intensity of effort. This is for hard gainers. This is for... Busy mothers, busy fathers. This is for entrepreneurs, people who have better things to do with their time than to stare at themselves in the mirror at crunch for nine hours a week. That's what this is for. If you are a hobbyist bodybuilder, if you're a 22 year old dude and you like hiring photographers to take pictures of you in fucking Planet Fitness, this isn't for you. 
This is for people with other shit going on. And you need this because strength and muscle means health, means longevity, means preserving your youth. So if you are a busy person, you find yourself wasting, spending way too much time in the gym, and you actually don't look like uh, Mike O'Hearn like you expected to, well, this is for you. So use something that, in, and in most cases, you're going to see way better results because in the golden air system, I teach you exactly how to load and fatigue the muscle correctly. And again, if you want my personal help, if you want to join my private coaching group, Unlimited, me as your mentor and your coach for life, there's a link in my description to book a call with me to learn about that too. All right. So that's that. I, I, would, I just want to hear one physiological, logical reason for multiple sets. Because I haven't heard one. All right, I'm going to go over some questions now after ranting. Is shoulder press enough for upper chest and side delts? Yeah. But again, depends. Do you have the genetics to look like a bodybuilder? Are you a bodybuilder? Are you a fitness model? You need to, you need to consider all the things here. If you are an average Joe with average genetics... Are you going to see a difference adding in an incline press? Probably not. If you are a bodybuilder, a physique athlete, a fitness model, you have those genetics, you have that muscularity, will you see a difference with an incline press? Probably. So these are the things you got to consider. It, it, adding exercises like incline press or all these other things is not going to take you from average to above average. If you have average genetics, you have average genetics. And most of the time, these additional exercises will be just a waste of your time because you won't see a visible difference. Um, but I believe, you know, personally, I, I don't even bother with an incline press um, regularly. Sometimes I'll throw it in there. But it wouldn't hurt to have alternating workouts. A workout A where you do a flat press, workout B, where you do an incline press. But with average genetics, genetics, are you going to see a noticeable difference? Prob probably not. Can I use resistance band instead of TRX? You can use whatever you want. It doesn't matter which tool you use. The goal or, or the, uh, the principles of stimulating muscle are simple. Work your muscles extremely hard against resistance. Whether that's a resistance band, TRX, a bag of rocks, doesn't matter. Some tools, however, are more effective and efficient at doing this than others. A resistance band is inefficient, relatively ineffective. TRX is pretty inefficient, and at a certain point, pretty ineffective. A dumbbell or a barbell is leaps and bounds more efficient and more effective than a TRX or resistance band. Your own body weight performed correctly is more effective. An exercise machine, a well-built exercise machine, is even more efficient than a barbell. I would not recommend training with resistance bands and TRX. Most people, there's a gym within throwing distance from you. Just go there. Or buy a set of adjustable dumbbells. I do drop sets in most of my exercises. Is that okay? Yeah, it's okay. But again, you know, you might be take, you might be doing more than is necessary. But I don't think you're going to overtrain doing that. Just another version of volume. Yeah, I mean, so here's the thing. Here's here's the argument for drop sets. This is what I tell people to do. If you do one set to failure, okay, and you're done with the exercise, and you're like, I don't know, I don't, I don't really feel like I really fatigued my muscle, then do another set. 
So the whole thing is you can get optimal results in one set. But remember, we have to train with hu with a huge amount of intensity, high intensity. Now, if your one set looks like Brad Schoenfeld <laughs> or pretty much anyone else you see training on YouTube or Instagram, low intensity, as soon as it gets, you know, uh, uh, and then they set it down, well, mm, will it stimulate gains? Yeah, but is it going to be optimal? Probably not. So whether or not you need a drop set just depends on how hard you train. <clears throat> there will be a point where if you try to do a drop set, you won't even be able to do it. You can drop the weight 40 50%. You'll get two repetitions, fail on the third. So you want to train to a point where you can't even tolerate drop sets. Don't leave. One of my clients was telling me this. He was leaving a little bit in the tank in order to be able to do the drop set. You don't want to do that. Okay, self-taught hitter and workouts at home. You're doing TSC without any computer feedback. Second set feels necessary as it skyrockets intensity. See, that's the thing. You should work on learning how to get all that intensity with just one set. Some of you guys might need additional sets to accumulate the amount of fatigue and muscle fiber recruitment to get to the point where you're pushing really, really hard. But... That's why you should join my coaching group so I can teach you how to do this so that we don't need a second set and you can work out with better results in half the time. So that's kind of my thoughts and recommendations. This is true. You, you see the same people in the gym every day for multiple hours doing set after set, and they look the same month after month. So we kind of have to look at where are these people's goals a lot of people, remember guys, they, they kind of use the gym for recreation. So they might be okay with that. So my recommendation of training single sets, high intensity training, well, it's not for them. It's not for the people who enjoy going to the gym and doing rep after rep, set after set, and looking the same month after month. You know, they probably just like going. Remember, this is for the people who want to see fast results and, and have other obligations that don't allow them to spend multiple hours a week in the gym. That's what this is for. Because you can spend an hour and a half in the gym every single day. You're going to see the same and probably worse results than, you, than using my system. But if your reasoning is you like to go, well, then that's fine. This is not for them. Got to work with Dr. Graves. Oh, that's cool. That's true. Don't mind taking days off, knowing your muscle loss doesn't occur at all. Yeah, guys, I was like, I was pretty sick for two or three days. <clears throat> like, I'm still weak. I got prostitutes in my elbow. Look at that. My elbow's all inflamed and beat up. So I'm not going to be training for a while, not until this thing heals. Um, no, I feel like deflated, kind of. But I know I didn't lose muscle. I didn't even lose any weight. So I've been sick on the couch for two days. Whatever. I didn't even lose any weight. It's all in your head. How would you compare one set to failure to what Dorian Yates Mike Mentor did? They did mostly just one set. So, so Mike, um, Mike Menser, his heavy duty approach was one set or a drop set. Dorian Yates did one set with a lot of exercises, but did multiple sets with some of them. But what he did was warm up sets and then one working set to failure. Dorian Yates simply did too much. He did more than he needed to. And he was still doing about a tenth of what all the other bodybuilders were doing. Mike Mentor just did one set. 
I've seen you do two exercises for back and chest. If someone wanted to prioritize shoulders over chest, would it be smart to do only one exercise for chest and do a shoulder press and a lateral raise? That could be an approach. Um, yeah, what you want to do is reserve your recovery ability for the muscle groups. Reserve your effort and your recovery ability for the muscle groups that aren't responding as well. But remember, shoulders, you know, I've noticed this. Shoulders seem to be a lot genetic. So you've got to have broad bone structure in your shoulders in order for them to look impressive. Um, now, remember these big, silly, round-looking shoulders? Like, um, I'll show you. Um so I think a lot of this comes from your, your shoulders are probably perfectly fine. And, and in which case, if you want to focus on them more, yeah, I would say do an overhead press and a lateral raise and, you know, maybe remove one. But don't copy my workout. I'll tell you why I do a chest press and a chest fly. It's because I like them. That's the only reason. CB. You got to remember these capped, round, silly, ridiculous shoulders that you see in the IFBB. So I think a lot of you, a lot of the times, you guys are comparing yourselves to these guys, but you need to remember that these are results, the, the results of like trend balloon and a huge amount of steroids. All right. So if you've got this as as your aiming point, you need to remember that these are very, very, very steroid enhanced with really good genetics all right most of you guys without great genetics and huge amounts of drugs you would never have shoulders like that no matter what the hell you did for your training okay so keep in mind a lot of people have this really unrealistic view of what deltoid should look like and you're getting it from you know people like this so your shoulders are probably fine that would be a good approach um but honestly, I don't think you need to. All right, let's see. Yeah, true. All right, I have a chest press. Link you the picture. I don't think I can get pictures on this, but I can answer this question. How would you adjust your seat to get the most tension? Tension, okay, don't confuse tension with effort. You get the most tension with the most effort. There, You don't adjust the exercise for tension. As long as you are addressing the muscle group based on its function, the higher the effort results in the most smarter unit recruitment and the most tension. So the C adjustment has nothing to do with tension. But ideally, you'd want the handles at or below the chest. That's it. But changing seat position doesn't. And this is what the, the retarded fitness industry makes people believe. Do this exercise this way for more tension. It's not how your body works. Let's see. You mentioned experimenting with two sets for calves. Did you track better gains for the extra set? No, nope, my calves pretty much stayed the same. Um, what I do, I do one set of calves because after one set of calves, I could barely walk anyway. Um, I don't know if I, if I mentioned I experimented with two sets, I'll tell you one thing, everything has stayed the same. <laughs> Remember once you reach your, your kind of your, your genetic limit, um, not much is going to change anything. So triceps takes most of the arm size. So you should focus more on triceps, right? What do you mean focus more on triceps? Nope, your whole frame of thinking is completely wrong. You don't focus more on a muscle group. What do you mean by that? Do more exercises, do more sets, train it more frequently. Well, we know more exercises, more sets, and more frequency don't result in more muscle growth. So what do you mean by focus more? All right, that's 
your, that's your old indoctrinated way of thinking intertwining with what I'm teaching you. You don't focus more on a muscle group. Unless there's a lagging muscle group, you reduce the volume of the groups that respond better, but that's about it. <laughs> How do you know if you're overtraining or just bad sleep? If you have to ask that question, the answer is sleep. <laughs> that's true. That's true. All right. I'm going to answer one more question. Let's see. Remember, guys, if you haven't tried it, try the golden era system. In worst case scenario, you're going to get the exact same results spending one-fifth or one-sixth of the time in the gym. But in almost all cases, you're going to see better results. GoldenEraSystem.com. Does working muscle in a stretch position improve muscle growth? No. But what it does, it could potentially increase the amount of effort, which will result in muscle growth. That's why sometimes I recommend this for people who have um, lagging arms because sometimes it makes you train harder and training harder stimulates more muscle, more growth. But it's, it's really nothing about the stretch position. It's about increasing intensity. Been a year since I started the VIP class. Yep, I remember this guy. So I turned three months ago, and progress is great. Again, guys, click the link in my description if you want to join my VIP. Unlimited access, lifetime access. <clears throat> I'll teach you all this stuff in depth and personally guide you along the way. All right. VIP mentorship will transform your physique so quickly, it'll make your fucking head spin. What percent of the exercise benefit is achieved the last rep to failure? More than 50%? Way more than 50%. You can't quantify it because it is different for everybody. Everybody has a different threshold, but it's way more than 50%. All right. You mentioned in an older video that bench press is a limited movement. Has your opinion changed now that you mentioned your chest preferences? Um, I'm not really sure what you're asking, but the bench press is a limited movement. My opinion is never going to change about that. Um, it's it's too it's it's a technical skill, so it makes it just unnecessarily more difficult to perform with no additional benefit. Um, just not my favorite thing. What do you feel about mobility workouts just to keep your body movable? It's a bunch of fucking nonsense. Mobility shit is nonsense. Mobility is a combination of flexibility and strength, both of which are improved drastically through simple strength training. Strength training improves or enhances flexibility. All the literature shows that. Strength training improves strength. Mobility is a combination of strength and flexibility. So if you improve... Strength, flexibility, mobility improves on its own. All these mobility workouts are fucking retarded Instagram bullshit. They don't do anything. They give you the illusion that they do something because you're putting your joints in unsafe positions. And eventually you get better at putting your joints in these unsafe positions. So you think you're more mobile, but you're not because you're not going to use those positions <laughs> ever. Best exercise for the adductor muscles. Does it make sense to have a separate one for them? Yeah, I do adductor exercises. Um, it's just hip adductor. I, I, I do them with my leg training. Um, because believe it or not, the adductor muscles are a huge muscle group in your legs. And um, most of you have access to an adductor machine, so I would use it. Definitely. All right, guys, that's it for me. Uh, remember, to go to goldenairsystem.com. Use the program. Try the program, especially if you're busy um you're gonna want to do golden air system and worst case scenario you're gonna see the exact same results with a shitload of time saved in an almost almost every case way better results and if you want my personal help unlimited access to me lifetime access to me as your coach and your mentor 
click that link below to book a call with me and join my VIP program. I will make you an expert in all this, transform your physique in the process.